Welcome to OECD Podcast, where policy meets people. No corner of the world has been spared from the coronavirus, but the pandemic hasn't affected women and men equally. On an international scale, women are bearing the brunt of the pandemic's economic and social consequences. I'm Karina Pizer, and you're listening to OECD Podcasts. Every March, International Women's Day gives us a chance to take stock of what life looks like for women around the world, and this year, that's particularly important. COVID-19 has already threatened decades of progress toward gender equality, but it's also created an opportunity to rethink our unequal social and economic systems and identify innovative ways to close the gender gap. And for inspiration, there's no better place to start than cities, especially those with strong women leaders. Today, we'll hear about what two important cities are doing to improve women's livelihoods and increase their representation in politics and business. One is big, one is small, and they're in different world regions, yet many of the challenges they face overlap. Later in this episode, we'll hear from Diane Rodriguez Franco, the Secretary of Women's Issues in Bogota, Colombia, about what life has been like for women during the pandemic in a city of 8 million people and where things go from here. But first, we'll speak with Mayor Lisa Helps of Victoria, British Columbia, a city of 92,000, about her vision for more egalitarian leadership and the roadblocks she's faced along the way. Mayor Helps, thank you for joining us and welcome to the OECD podcast. Thank you. My pleasure. So, Mayor Helps, you're the second woman to be elected mayor of Victoria, and I'd like to focus today's conversation on the work you've done to improve gender equality and make the city a better place for women. A report from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives that I believe is from 2019 found that Victoria was the third best city in Canada to be a woman in terms of equal opportunity and representation. I'm curious what you attribute to that success and also where you can identify areas for improvement. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't want to start with the negative, but I will say that I believe in 2017 and 2018, uh, or at least one of those years, we were the first best place uh, in Canada to be a woman, and we dropped by two. Uh, and I think that's because, if I can remember the, the reports correctly, increasing uh, income disparity between men and women in our region. I think that's one of the areas where we have more work to do. Our largest private sector industry is high tech, which is a very male dominated industry. And you won't find many CEOs or COOs of tech companies who are women. They're few and far between. And then other two sectors in our economy drivers are the provincial government. And again, I don't know what the breakdown in terms of the civil service is, Anecdotally, I know that there are a lot of uh, women in deputy minister positions, which are the highest paid civil servants. Uh, But another, the third economic arm, I guess, is tourism. And there are some well-paying jobs in tourism, but also it's a lot of service sector jobs. And so I think that's part of where the focus needs to be in in terms of getting back to number one. But certainly uh, on the flip side, uh, what's going well here is uh, many of the local organizations are run by women. So the city is run by myself and our city manager is also a woman. Our economic development organization, which is really an amazing organization, CEO is a woman. The uh, Songhees Development Corporation, so one of our indigenous development corporations, CEO is a woman. Uh, So there's a lot of women in leadership positions locally, which I think probably contributes to some of our success. Yeah, it sounds like indeed there are a great deal of women represented in leadership positions. Unfortunately, there's no global data on local level representation of women in these types of elected roles, but there are estimates that show that around 20% of councillors in city governments are women and 5% of mayors are women. So obviously you're among that 5%, uh, but that's a very small number. I'm curious in terms of the 20% estimate, how you think Victoria measures up. Well, the city of Victoria, just recently we had a by-election and our council is now five men and four women. Prior to that, since 2011, when I was elected as a councillor, it's been five women and four men. So we've had gender balance on our council in slight favor of women. Here in the region, there are 13 municipalities. At this time, there are, I think, four or five women leaders. Maybe there are just three of us now, three out of 13. So that's a drop. I think it was five and it dropped down to three. So there's more work to do and maybe we can get into some of the why. For example, I am the co-chair of the BC Urban Mayors Caucus, which is a group of mayors that represent 55% of the population of British Columbia. So the big city mayors. And I am the only woman in that group. And that's a change from last term. Uh, I had more colleagues across the province who were women mayors. And at least a few of them decided not to run again because of the 
terrible misogyny they face, the tone of criticism. And so I think there's a lot of work to do in getting that number up globally from 5% to uh, something (laughs) a little bit better than that anyways. I think that's something that's really difficult to tackle, that this kind of generalized misogyny that you describe and that tone of criticism. Are there any measures or initiatives that you've planned or that you kind of intend to launch in order to help fix that or at least make people more aware of the consequences of their bias? To be honest, it's a very difficult thing for a female politician to do because it just comes across as whiny. But there is a group out of, I believe it's Simon Fraser University, which is a university in Vancouver, that did a really in-depth analysis of women in leadership and social media. And I think studies like that, they're kind of independent third party that validate some of our experiences, I think will start to help change the, the conversation a little bit. So you'd mentioned the pay disparities between men and women, and that's something that I'd like to go back to, Um, especially with the pandemic. A lot of the economic fallout has hit women particularly hard. That's because they're disproportionately represented in a lot of frontline jobs, in healthcare, and hospitality. And so many have had to leave the workforce because of this kind of inevitable and growing trade-off between professional and domestic life. But in addition to these new job losses, I read a study from last summer conducted by the University of British Columbia that said that the pandemic has also worsened pre-existing pay gaps between men and women. Are there any concrete measures that you've taken or that need to be taken to narrow that gap and bring women's salaries up to par with men's? There are a number of them. The City of Victoria, our economic recovery plan, uh, it's called Victoria 3.0, Recovery, Reinvention and Resilience. And the thrust of that plan is really to create inclusive, low carbon prosperity. That sounds like a bunch of words. What does that mean? Uh, The low carbon piece is, I think, explanatory. There's actually a lot of money to be made in tackling the climate crisis. But there is also an imperative towards inclusive prosperity and not just for women, but for women, youth, people of color, indigenous people. And Victoria 3.0 really kind of takes aim at that inclusive prosperity approach. A couple of initiatives that we're working on right now, one is called COAST, uh, the Center for Ocean Applied Sustainable Technologies. And if you think that women in politics have it bad, uh, in Canada, in the ocean and marine sector, only 2% of the workforce are women. And that is a massive industry here uh, in Victoria, in British Columbia. And so part of a coast's mandate is to grow sustainable ocean technologies, but to do it in a way that creates more opportunities for women in the ocean and marine sector. So from the very founding of this organization, which it's literally just a month old, if that, there's a focus on who's not at the table, who's not in those jobs, who's not in those well-paying jobs, and then how do we create programs to get them here? Another initiative that we're working on, again, this is just brand new, but uh, Northeastern University out of Boston, they've got a campus in Vancouver, and they're looking to set up some programs here in Victoria in partnership with the city and others, again, deliberately focused on who's most suffered from the pandemic, and how do we get those people into the jobs that are needed for the 21st century. On the topic of recovery, hopefully as we start to see a light at the end of this tunnel, we can think about ways to make our cities better. I'm curious how Victoria and its residents have benefited from international cooperation, notably as part of initiatives like the OECD Champion Mayors for Inclusive Growth Program. How have you benefited from that in your leadership? And I'm curious if there are any examples or strategies that you've taken from other cities as part of the OECD network that you've successfully applied to the local context. I would say that I am relatively still new to the OECD Champion Mayors Program and honored to be part of it. But already in our short time as participants, there is one thing that we have uh, taken away and are looking to implement here, and that is a rent bank. So there was a conversation hosted by the OECD Champion Mayors on housing security, housing supply, affordable housing. And I believe it was the mayor of Denver. He was on a webinar that I listened to talking about the work that they've done on rent banks there and on preventing evictions and preventing homelessness. And in addition to women being less well compensated for employment in some jobs, women, particularly women with children, 
are more uh, vulnerable to evictions for, for all sorts of reasons, uh, particularly single moms precariously employed. And so, you know, again, that's just a small example, but we've reached out to the mayor of Denver, got some information about their rent bank and are working with partners to implement that here. More generally, uh, I firmly believe, and this, you know, might be my optimism as a mayor, but I firmly believe that cities around the world hold the keys to the future. We know what needs to be done to create the inclusive, prosperous, low carbon, resilient cities. We know it because we are working on it every day. And so I just think international cooperation and learning from others, it saves so much time and energy because you can just go pluck something from Bogota or Bilbao and uh, adapt it to local circumstances here. So I, I think there's massive benefit. One really troubling consequence of the pandemic has been an uptick in domestic violence across the world. And women have fewer outlets to report cases, and it's just more difficult to get out of an abusive home. I'm curious in Victoria and in British Columbia, if there are new strategies that you've put in place to encourage women to come forward, despite the constraints posed by the public health crisis. The Vic PD, the Victoria Police Department, has a domestic violence unit. So that's been our response for many years now is a unit dedicated to that with officers who are trained. We've got a very, very interesting partnership with the Victoria Women's Sexual Assault Center. So if someone experiences sexual assault, rape, any kind of violence, instead of going to the hospital, which is the last place you want to be, like if you've just been sexually assaulted, you do not want to be in a hospital with a police officer. So there's a clinic at the Victoria Women's Sexual Assault Center. It's a soft landing pad. It's such a beautiful space. And there's a room for kids. And, you know, the, while the mom is being interviewed, again, female officers who are trained in critical incidents. And so that partnership is really unique. It started here in Victoria and I think now is being exported across British Columbia. But that's one way in which we take domestic violence, particularly uh, sexual assault, really seriously and have quite an innovative response. So I guess kind of a forward looking question to wrap things up. I'm curious if there are any lessons you've learned from your own leadership and strategies that you would recommend to other cities looking to adopt a gender lens to make their cities more inclusive and representative of women. Well, again, this isn't rocket science at all. And one of the things that works really well in Victoria is the way we do things. And that is through really, really deep collaboration. And it, it may be because it's, you know, women who are leading a lot of the, the organization. One of the ways that we've had success in Victoria, whether it's working on uh, gender issues or other issues, is getting everyone to the table at the same time and not just the easy people. We have a slogan in Victoria, don't leave out the difficult people. You know, if there's one piece of advice I can impart, don't leave out the difficult people. When we bring the difficult people to the table, the people whose messages we find it hard to hear, are the people who sometimes aren't aware of what they're bringing into the room, having them at the table makes the solutions that we're developing better every single time. I think that's so important, especially for these days when everything feels so polarized. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, my pleasure as well. Thanks for the great questions. And yeah, honored to uh, be part of the OECD Champion Mayors Program. Now we'll turn to Ms. Diane Rodriguez Franco, the Secretary of Women's Issues in Bogota, Colombia. Ms. Franco serves in a city government that since 2020 has been led by a woman mayor for the first time in its history. Together, they're working tooth and nail to make women's voices heard in a country where men have long held the monopoly on decision making. Secretary Franco, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for being here. It's a pleasure for me. So one devastating consequence of the pandemic across the world and in Colombia as well has been a striking uptick in violence against women. And I know that tackling domestic violence has been a major priority of the city government for a number of years, but especially under the leadership of the current mayor and with your support. But during the pandemic, it's been a particularly difficult situation. Women have had fewer outlets to leave in abusive homes. There's been increased tension due to lockdown measures and economic stress. 
And I think that in general, violence against women and girls is a really difficult issue to tackle. A lot of women say that they feel like authorities don't take their complaints seriously. And after reading about the situation in Colombia, I see a lot of people attribute this reality to a kind of culture of machismo, which, you know, that's something that's really difficult to tackle. It's hard to craft policies that address something as diffuse and entrenched as a cultural phenomenon. So I'm curious what you've done to make the city a better and safer place for women. So indeed, as you were saying, as in many cities uh, during the pandemic in Bogota, the number of cases and reports of gender-based violence have increased. And so we realized that that was one of the things we needed to address the most and we needed to adapt our services and our response to the particular context especially because we were facing the challenge of knowing that services as we knew them, right, as we used to know them, going walk-ins and in person, were probably going to be impossible. So we decided to strengthen basically our online and telephone channels. So let me give you a little bit of an overview. First, in Bogota, we have what is called the Purple Line. The Purple Line is a 24-7 toll-free hotline in Bogota. It's for women in need of counseling and legal assistance. And it's either in cases of gender-based violence, including domestic violence, but also for any other violation of their rights. And so during lockdown, what we did uh, in the first few months, in March and April, was we tripled our capacity. So we increased our response. Our effectiveness went from an effectiveness rate of 30% to 90%. So we're answering nine out of 10 calls immediately. During 2020, just to give you an idea, the Purple Hotline attended close to 25,000 women by phone and 29,000 women via WhatsApp. We also realized that it was not enough to have online or telephone or email or WhatsApp services. We had to create something different. So we asked ourselves, where are the only places women are allowed to go, especially during the strictest lockdown? And it was pharmacies and supermarkets. So we launched an innovative strategy called Safe Spaces, Espacios Seguros in Spanish. It's an alliance with the private sector. So just one month after the strict lockdown, we launched this strategy. And it's being implemented in over 600 supermarkets, pharmacies, and gas stations throughout the city. And what happens? When a woman arrives at any of these places, she can contact the store manager. And the store manager will give her two options. If the woman's life is at risk, the manager will call the police, who in turn will report the case to the secretary for women. So we can offer, in tandem, legal and psychological assistance. Or it might be the case that the victim is not ready for police help at the moment, but she just wants to receive legal counseling or emotional counseling or guidance in general. And so in that case, they just report name and telephone number to us, to the women's secretariat, and in that case, we contact her. The supermarket strategy is something that I read about and I found it really interesting. I'm curious how effective it's been. Did you see a lot of women reporting cases? So that, that's a great question because the next day we had our first case. That was a like a air of optimism, but we only received 22 cases. What we've been doing during these past few months is trying to see what do we need to do to basically get women to access these Places Because why are women calling the hotline so much, but not arriving to these places? Probably women are not so used to asking for help in a supermarket or in a pharmacy or in a gas station because that's the private sector. They're more used to say, okay, I need to go to the institutional services, to the police. So what we're doing right now is we're trying to understand why is it we didn't get more women to access these places. One hypothesis is that women might think, oh, this was working during the strictest lockdown, but it's not working today. So what we're thinking of doing and we're planning on doing is during March, we launch the strategy and actually explain what happened, explain that women did access these services, explain that it's still ongoing. Yeah, I look forward to seeing how that continues to play out because I think that's something really interesting and that could be applied to other cities using supermarkets in this way. 
And continuing to look forward, hopefully now that we can see beyond the pandemic and start thinking about an economic recovery, cities are a really important place to start because they have been so affected by the pandemic. And Colombia is a relatively new member to the OECD system. It's just since 2020. And I'm curious how you feel the city of Bogota and its residents have benefited from international cooperation through that membership. Notably, I'm thinking of initiatives like the OECD Champion Mayors for Inclusive Growth Initiative. And just to give our listeners a a sense of what that initiative involves, it's a way to encourage collaboration among cities on four key areas. One is education. The second is labor and markets and skills. Third is housing in the urban environment. And four is infrastructure and public services. And these are all really important areas. But I think after the pandemic, it's going to be even more important to kind of fortify all of these areas of urban life. Basically, we're 100 percent confident on the importance of the international cooperation, right, to the development of the city and also to improve the objectives of the Secretary for Women. I think international cooperation allows us to carry out innovative projects. It allows us and gives us an an opportunity to think outside the box. It's very common to see inertia driving decisions in the public sector. And so having a life that actually says, wait, things can be done differently and there's an option to do them and there's financing to do them and it's fine to innovate. It's also fine not to succeed when you innovate, which is important, right? Especially because low income and medium income countries were afraid of innovating because of failure, because resources are so scarce. And I think being part of an international community of international cooperation where innovation is valued, where taking risks is valued. We were just talking about the safe spaces strategy, Karina, and you asked me, have many women assisted? No, but it's fine to say no, right? Because we need to be reflexive, to learn, to look back. We don't often do that in the public sector, right? So being part of this international community, I think, opens the space to innovation. So Bogota, right now, we have a wide international support for the development of our care services system. Bogota is actually the first city to implement what is we're calling in Spanish, un sistema distrital de cuidado. It's focused on transforming unpaid care work. And so right now, we're receiving cooperation and international assistance from partners, from UN Women, from the Open Society Foundation, for the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, just among others. And I think they're doing it because it's innovation and because we're part of the OECD. And so that gives a sign to other cooperants to say, hmm, let us jump in, let us chip in and see if this works. So it generates this snowfall effect. Here into the pandemic, it's fairly well established that women have lost out economically at a greater rate than men. I know that when the pandemic started, Bogota had set up what it called the solidarity system to provide kind of a basic income for all people who were struggling to meet basic living costs due to lockdown measures. I'm curious, nearly a year on, the extent to which it's made a difference for women in particular, given that they have faced so much financial difficulty over the past year. Indeed, women have been the hardest hit by the pandemic. And also because, as in other countries, we're the frontline workers of the pandemic, right? Both in health, but also in the household. I usually like to ask people, imagine what this pandemic would have been like without women. In Bogota, 52% of the health sector is made up by women. But also imagine in the household, because women, we have been giving up our jobs also to take care of children at home, of the elderly, and employment also has been higher for women. At the worst point of the pandemic in Bogota, unemployment peaked to 22% for men and 26% for women, which is a huge gap. I hope that this pandemic helps us recognize the work of women and redistribute the work of women and reduce the amount of time women spend in all of this. So going back to basic income, it's still going on today. 
So Bogota has not backed down on that. Part of it is given by the city of Bogota, but also part of it, it is done in cooperation with the national government, right, as a joint strategy. And the main beneficiaries have been women. So at one point, and this percentage might have switched a little bit, perhaps even increased, but 62% of those basic transfers went to women. So we were just talking about how women are so overrepresented in frontline work, which is often mm -hmm. more precarious, more demanding, and not as well paid. But there are other areas where women are underrepresented in the labor force, notably in politics and decision-making roles. And Colombia actually has really made impressive strides mm. in improving women's representation, especially in senior level business roles. According to the World Economic Forum, more than 50% of managerial positions in Colombia are held by women. That's parity. But I think it's interesting to see how that number changes quite drastically when it comes to female representation on boards of publicly listed companies. So it drops from over 50% in these managerial senior level business roles to just 13.5% in board roles. One way that countries and cities have worked to narrow that type of gap is by establishing quotas. Is that something that Bogota has, has worked with? And what is your view on that strategy? Beautiful. So indeed, your description is acute and perfect. Um, and that's indeed what happens. So given our first woman mayor, she's been trying to keep the balance in 50%. So Bogota, for instance, has 35 boards of the public sector. And of the ones that depend directly on the mayor, she's been appointing and trying to keep parity. So 50-50 at least. And trying to, you know, explain the discourse and why it's important and why women we should be in every decision-making space. And so that's the case of Bogota. It's been harder at the more local level, both in boards, but also in the more participatory representative organs, right? There we haven't reached. 50-50 parity at all. Has there been any pushback on this attempt to create gender parity? I know that in some settings and some circles, it can be better perceived than others. For me, it's still incredible that we need to explain it. So that's my dream. When will we stop needing to explain the why? But it has been harder, the pushback, going back to your culture of machismo. I think there's a lot of the culture of machismo ingrained and the fact that we've been used to seeing men in power, men making decisions. The mayor and I, we use an expression a lot, which is one of the things we need to do. And made basically this, I think, wraps up everything we've been talking about since violence to care work to women in boards is we need to unlearn machismo because we usually talk about what we need to learn. Right. We need to learn more about this, learn more about this, learn more about diversity, learn more about a gender approach, learn more about how to take care of our planet and tackle the global climate crisis. Right. But what do we need to unlearn? And so we need to unlearn machismo. That is such a fantastic way to put it. And I think it's a great note to end our discussion on that we can encourage everyone to learn about ways to improve gender representation, but also unlearn some of the stereotypes that have kept women out of the workforce and out of public life. We need to basically free up some of our space to learn new things. And so let's start by unlearning machismo. Well, hopefully your leadership and the mayor's leadership will continue that unlearning and learning process for Bogota and other cities around the world. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Karina, the pleasure is mine. Thank you so much for hosting me. And thank you so much for your questions and for your legitimate interest in what we're doing in Bogota. To learn more about OECD's work on cities, international cooperation, and the pandemic's impact on women, go to www.oecd.org slash coronavirus, www.oecd.org slash CFE, and www.oecd.org slash gender. To learn more about the Champion Mayors for Inclusive Growth Initiative, check out www.oecd-inclusive.org slash champion hyphen mayors. To listen to other OECD podcasts, find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and soundcloud.com slash OECD.